Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moli wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, an iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are so delighted that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcasts. Our guest today is CNN correspondent Renee Marsh. She is here to celebrate a really heartwarming and powerful book. It's called The Miracle Worker's Boy vs. Beast. Before we invite Renee into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Freaky Funky Fish, Odd Facts About Fascinating Fish by Deborah Kemp Shoemaker. From zapping, stinging, even singing to playing dead or having a see-through head, discover the interesting things different fish do to survive in this delightful non-fiction rhyming picture book. This really is a fun book. The illustrations are wonderful. The rhymes are beautiful. And it's a great way to introduce your kids to the amazing world of the ocean and get them interested in the STEM fields. Freaky Funky Fish, Odd Facts About Fascinating Fish by Deborah Kemp Shoemaker. This episode is also brought to you by The Power of Gratitude, Unlocking Hidden Treasures by Ruth Malley. Why is gratitude so important? Gratitude is a beautiful thing to teach our children and to learn from our children. It can transform how we all look at life. The Power of Gratitude, Unlocking Hidden Treasures will help your children in so many ways. They'll begin to notice the many blessings that surround them each and every day. They will begin to appreciate what others do for them. They will begin to appreciate how wonderful it is is to be able to do things for others. It will help them build strong relationships and improve their health. It really is a powerful book, a powerful lesson to teach our kids as early as possible. The Power of Gratitude, Unlocking Hidden Treasures by Ruth Malley. Join us right now from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Our guest today is an Emmy-nominated correspondent for CNN. She's here to celebrate her beautiful and really powerful uh, children's book. It's called The Miracle Worker's Boy vs. Beast. Please welcome to the show, Renee Marsh. Hey, Renee, how are you? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you and talk all about this book uh, and the mission behind it. It's, uh, you know, in reading and preparation for the show, it's a pretty powerful story. Why don't you tell us first about Boy vs. Beast, please? So this is just a just magical book. It is colorful as far as the illustrations go, and it has a lot of escapism when you first open up this book, and it sets the scene of this magical place where the main character, Blake, uh, finds himself. And this really is just a story about power of hope and faith when you're facing some of life's toughest challenges. And Blake, he's facing what I like to call a monster of a problem. And really only a miracle can save him. And the key for Blake is that he has to figure out how does he unlock his miracle? And I don't want to uh, spoil the book for anyone. So uh, if you read the book, you will find out whether or not Blake figures out the key to unlocking his miracle, because there is something very specific that he must do in order to receive that miracle. Now, I understand that you wrote this book on your iPhone. I did. <laughs> I wrote it in uh, my iPhone, in the Notes app, in the hospital while um, watching my son endure cancer treatments. Uh, and I wrote this book at a time where I needed a lot of hope in my life. And 
I love to read to my son and my son, Blake, uh, who passed away this year uh, at just two years old. He loved to read this. So this book is in honor of his favorite pastime of reading. But any parent knows that when you're reading a book to your child, you're reading for them. But it's a bonus if there's a message for us as well, the readers. And uh, as I said, I was writing this book at a time where I particularly needed a lot of hope in my life. And I didn't have a lot of books like this to read to Blake when we were going through what we were going through uh, with him. And I really wish that we did. And that was the reason why I decided to write this book, Um, not only to give hope to people reading it, but the dual mission here is to raise funds for pediatric cancer research. Uh, All of the profits from this book will be donated to pediatric cancer research. Well, first off, I'm incredibly sorry for your loss. I can't imagine that, being the dad of of two and now adult kids. Uh, And I know how difficult it was, you know, when my son busted up his lip and we had to take him to get stitches and when my daughter got a vaccine and you know she cried on my shoulder I can't imagine enduring that experience in the hospital and and, and losing your son so so I am very sorry but it seems like something beautiful has grown from that place of sorrow absolutely I mean I think that Uh, This is what life really is. When you take a step back, it really is a mixture of good and bad. It really is a duality of, you know, for everything negative that happens, there are also positive things. Um, So if I could rewrite my personal story, I absolutely would. Uh, But I don't have control over that. But you're right. Uh, In the midst of what was not desired, I was able to harvest something that I do think is beautiful, which is trying to help other people who may need that hope and sharing that message of hope uh, to potentially help inspire someone else who's facing some challenge. Um, I think that when you go through something that is very difficult in life, that is transformative, Uh, it does change you in a very profound and deep way. And that is what has happened to me through my life circumstances. And what makes me feel good and what helps me to heal is helping others. So this book is that. Um, It's helping others because I realized that when you look at the last year and a half, we've all been through a lot. We've all lived through a pandemic. We've all um, had to deal with some sort of challenge over the last year and a half. People have lost caregivers. Um, people have lost jobs. There's Life will guarantee challenges. Um, what I found very helpful for me is having hope in my survival toolkit. And that is what helped me to be even be here, survive what we've gone through, to talk to you and have this conversation with you today. And so that is something that I want to share, and it makes me feel good to share with others. Um, but as I said, it is this dual purpose of fixing a problem that I learned about only because of my personal experience with my son, which is that pediatric cancer is just heartbreakingly underfunded when it comes to research. So it's a twofold mission here. Yeah, I I, I want to definitely get into talking about uh, the the lack of research into pediatric cancer, but I'm wondering where that that hope for you comes from because you are have mentioned that there are so many people have gone through probably not something as difficult as losing a child, but we certainly have all gone through some challenges over the last year and a half. We all face challenges in our life. So many people don't have that hope they turn you know when they're facing the challenges they 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 they, all they find is despair or anger where was how did you have that hope and know that you could turn to that hope yeah i mean the first thing i would say is it's not easy so uh i acknowledge that when we are facing these challenges 
it is perfectly normal to wonder how will you overcome it. It's perfectly normal to be overwhelmed by it. I find myself in that position all the time. Um, I think that a lot of times we do have hope, but we don't give ourselves credit for it, right? As long as you make it to the next day, even if you crawl to the next day, uh, you haven't given up. And so, you know, we kind of at a certain point, um, you realize, number one, a couple of things that you there are things that are out of your control. So you can only focus on on what you do have control over. Right. And and the other item or the other thing that I would say is that, you know, nothing lasts forever. I mean, if if you look at some of the worst storms that we see, um, whether it's like a rainstorm, whatever, it doesn't last forever. The sun does eventually come out. So, I mean, I think that I would just tell people to sort of give themselves more credit than they probably are. The fact that you're making it from day to day, you've accomplished a lot. And I think sometimes if we kind of are gentler with ourselves and what we have been able to accomplish from day to day, um, that will help us to further move along this trajectory of life. Um, the other thing that's really been personally helpful to me is my family um, expressing how I feel, um, and them being supportive for me. My faith has really uh, also been the thing that has carried me through this. For every person, it's going to be different, but these are the things that have helped me to find hope. Uh, and, and believe it or not, also my son. I mean, he's not here in the physical, but he does continue to inspire me every single day. And I live on for him to create a legacy for him, give his life meaning, although it was short. So those are the things that really inspire me to keep going. Uh, but, you know, I've said this before, feeling moments of brokenness doesn't mean that you've lost the battle. Mm -hmm. I feel those moments of brokenness all the time, but it's your ability to piece yourself back together in between the crying, in between the heartbreak and move on to the next day. So I think if you had that realization that I'm broken, it doesn't mean that you're defeated. Mm -hmm. um, the ability to piece yourself back together and move forward is your strength and you should sort of recognize that. And I think that 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 allows there's a lot of power in recognizing the strength that we do have. You know, as you were mentioning, you know, just getting through the day, I, I yeah. had this I had this image of and we've all seen it, the marathon runner who collapses 15 yards from the finish line and then just gets up and courageously with the help sometimes of others or, or by themselves struggles just to crawl over that finish line and how we all celebrate that and how we all recognize what a great accomplishment that is. It's not a failure. It's something really special and something to be honored. That's, that's what I, I felt when you were speaking and, and. Oh my gosh, that's so good. That is so good because that if I were to paint a picture of what I was trying to say, that is it. You're right. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you fall across the finish line, if you crawl to the finish line. What it matters is that you made it there. And I think that is so key. And I think when we're like in the forest, we don't kind of give ourselves the credit of making it across the finish line. We just see the struggle that it took to get there. But you're right. The people on the sidelines are cheering you on because you made it across the finish line. They're not seeing your struggle. So I think a lot of times hope is in our perspective, right? How do we look at our circumstances within that we are within in that moment? Um, and sometimes a shift in our perspective is enough to kind of get us to that next point. Yeah. You know, as 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 we're talking here, I'm just getting the sense, you know, that that the spectators and cheering on. And at that moment, it's we're just cheering on another human being. And that's such a beautiful thing. And it seems like right now, and we've talked about it with different guests here on the podcast, we're at a point in our, our nation, in our world, 
when we seem so divided and it's really hard for us to see the humanity in somebody that we identify as being on a, a different side than we are. How do you think that Blake story in, in your experience, how, how can we use that to kind of help us all put down the, take off our team shirts and just put on mm-hmm. our human shirts? You know, I, I, and I work in the news. So like I, I see this stuff every single day. And when you do kind of live the hard parts of life, you really do kind of take a step back and evaluate just how silly it can be uh, to be so tribal. Because at the end of the day, you said it best. We're all humans, all occupying this one space, with his, which is planet Earth. Uh, and, um, you know, there, you have to almost like strip away wh- why we're really here and what really matters. Like, it's so easy to get distracted with, like you said, our team shirts and certain issues that do divide us as a country, as a nation, as a world. But we really have to get to the place of stripping back the layers of what is at the core really important. I was faced with figuring that out when I was going through all that I was going through with my son, because it just forces you to to kind of sit and think when you're in danger of losing something so special to you, it just causes you to reassess everything. Uh, And I think in some ways the pandemic did us where people had to sit still and people um, had some self-awareness and realizations and they made some changes in their life. Maybe it's their jobs, but I'm not quite sure it happened as a whole because that tribal nature is is still here um, and we see it playing out um, within our country. I just think that we all have to, to realize that, I mean, we're all of the same species, right? We're all mankind. And when you kind of boil it down, yes, we're not going to all agree, but we're at the core. We're all mankind. We're all in this together. Humanity is in this together. Um, I think we achieve more together than we do separately. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are all that. We're all part of that, that group of spectators cheering on that, that person struggling to fall across the finish line. Renee, we talked just briefly about pediatric cancer research and, you know, the other reason that you wrote The Miracle Workers, Boy vs. Beast. Why do you think there's such a lack of funding for research into this devastating um, illness? Yeah, I mean, I really kind of put my journalist hat on when we were going through treatments with Blake. And, you know, I dug into the numbers. I saw that the National Cancer Institute, which is the federal or the arm of the federal government that awards funding for cancer research. When you look at like a year like 2018, which is the full year I was able to look at all the numbers there, um, out of the billions of dollars that they doled out for cancer research, uh, pediatric cancer research only got like 5% of it, of the budget. So it, it, it truly is a sliver. And, you know, when you talk to people, and I've spoken to several oncologists and, um, and, and um, scientists who focus on pediatric oncology, and I've asked this very question, and it comes down to a numbers game. There are more adults that have cancer or are diagnosed with cancer than children. That is not disputable. So it's become, that is where most of the funds will go. Um, the problem is that cancer is the number one dis- killer of children by disease. So it becomes problematic when children who are our future of this country, the disease that kills them the most, doesn't get enough resources. So no one is arguing that children should get the same amount as adults. 
We know that if there is a, a, a large number of adults with a, a variety of this disease, that the research dollars need to address that. But I think that if you talk to anyone who um, is a scientist or researcher in this space, they say what children do get is, is not enough. And that's the bottom line. It's just not enough. Um, pharmaceutical companies don't really have an incentive to research and develop drugs specifically for children because it's not profitable for them. It's a very small profit margin for them. They make a lot more money developing drugs for adults because there's a large demand, and that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, so what I decided to do as a part of my commitment, because the specific type of brain cancer that Blake had, um, there was no substantial research, and that's like a terrible place to be. So in Blake's case, I mean, for his type of brain cancer that he had, when we dug into the internet and speaking to oncologists, there really was no substantial research. And what that means is no research means no specific treatment that is guaranteed to cure your child. And that is just a very terrible and heartbreaking place to be in when you're watching your child battle this disease. And so... I know the pain of seeing that. I know the circumstances and the, the consequences of that. I, I know it personally. And so this book is my personal commitment to fighting this disease and doing my part to raise money for research. Um, all of the profits will be donated to pediatric brain cancer research. But this is not just me. I mean, I met uh, several other parents who, um, you know, are selling t-shirts, they're, they're doing bake sales, they're shaving their heads, they're, they're doing everything to raise money for cancer research. And when you take a step back, that's not the way we ha we're going to solve this. I mean, it is noble of these parents. Uh, we should all do what we can, but we have to kind of get to a place, and I'm hoping that the more we talk about this, we get to a place as a country where we devote more resources here because I could sell a million books and it's still not going to fund mm -hmm. all the research that is necessary to save the lives of the children who, as I speak to you today, are in hospitals with diseases where there's just no cure for. Mm. I, you know, I don't know what would have been worse hearing the diagnosis that my son was suffering from brain cancer or then hearing and we don't have any way to help them, you know. I'm, I'm wondering, in, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to tell us how we can, beyond just buying the book, how we can get involved in, in helping to raise money and awareness. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, do you feel that this experience changed you as um, a reporter and, and how that might have changed you? I do. You know, I had a lot of, um, I wondered what that would be like in returning to work, uh, coming back to my job, because uh, I was on leave for almost two years caring for my son. And uh, I, I wondered, like, because I was a different person just entirely. And so how would that translate to what I do um, for a living, which is identify issues in society and tell stories and hope that the stories are impactful and lead to change. Um, and I would say that I believe that it has. I'm, I'm still figuring out the scope of how much it has changed me because I've only returned. I've been back to work um, for only just like about two months now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm still learning who the new Renee is as a journalist, but I am very much in tune deeply with people who are suffering in a specific circumstance. I deeply understand this concept of suffering on a level that I had never understood before and having such a deep understanding of humanity and human suffering ultimately kind of 
trickles down in how you report the story out and how you write the story and what you're focused on and what you see when you arrive on, at a scene and what questions you ask and the framing that is that uh, sticks out to you when you are presented with um, a story or during the course of an interview. So this has changed me um, in ways also that I'm still, I think, have yet to see, but uh, at the bare minimum, uh, I'm just in tune to a different level of human suffering that I had not been before. Wow. Such an, an a, a, a tragic and and really, but in the end, I think hopeful experience for you because I think that you you're showing us that no matter what, we can find hope and we can turn sufferings, turn tragedy into something beautiful. And B- Blake's life certainly has had a lot of meaning. Had a lot of meaning for you. And his life is going to continue and have meaning for other kids going forward. Uh, Renee, where can we um, go to, to, to learn more, uh, not only learn more about the Miracle Workers, Boy vs. Beast, but also learn how we can um, help, uh, you know, get that funding to pediatric brain cancer research? Yeah. So uh, I have... Lots of information on my website, which is ReneeMarsh.com. That's R-E-N-E-M-A-R-S-H.com. So you can learn about the book there. You can also learn about the research that we are venturing out on. It's pioneering in many ways, um, the research that we'll be funding uh, through the sales of this book. But then just broadly speaking, you know, I love to hear you ask me about how you can do more in this space because people like me need allies. And what that looks like is like, I'm a mother who lost her son, but you have two perfectly healthy children, but you want, you understand that something is wrong with this picture and you want to help. And the way people can do that is, um, you know, there are tons of pediatric cancer um, organizations. I've partnered with the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation. They're very good. Just spend some time on the website. They have lots of ways that people can engage in advocacy, or uh, also you can make donations to these organizations, or just learn about things happening in your community that's related to this issue. Um, so the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation is one. The Children's Oncology Group is another. Um, there's there's so, so many of these, but those are the two that I've been working with a lot. Uh, and it's a great starting point for people to um, – St. Baldrick's is another uh, organization that's doing a lot of really good work. Uh, so, you know, visit those websites. They have a wealth of information. Also, if people ever have an opportunity to have one-on-one time with their elected officials, I mean, let them know that you support increased federal funding for pediatric cancer research. Like, the more that these lawmakers hear this, that this is something that's supported by their constituents, uh, the more they will pay attention, because there are a lot of issues fighting for their attention here in Washington, D.C. And I know that all lawmakers care about children and cancer. I don't think you'll find anyone who doesn't care here in this town. The problem is where it falls on the priority list. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, there are a lot of things vying for their attention. And this one's this issue um, is not necessarily at the top of their list. But the more that they can hear about it from people in their districts, uh, the more that it goes up the ladder. And um, I think that that if people do that sort of thing and amplify some of these organizations. I know a lot of people are on social media. You know, follow these organizations. Alex Lemonade Stand is another good one. Um, and amplify the messages that these organizations have. Uh, I think that all those things will go a long way. Yeah, yeah. Well, we certainly want to encourage everybody to be a voice for those little ones who can't speak up for themselves. And um, I, I just want to thank you, Renee, for taking the time to be with us today to share your story, to give us hope and to help us look at life a a little bit differently. Yeah, I think that's the key. And I absolutely love your, um, 
your imagery that you painted of the marathon runner. And I think that that, if people just kind of lock into that imagery uh, today or this week or next month when they're struggling, if you remember that, I think that that really is the key to it all. I mean, you captured the essence of what I'm trying to say. It's like people are cheering you on on the sideline, but sometimes we focus on the fact that we stumbled across the finish line. And it's it's not that. The focus should be that you made it across the finish line. Absolutely. We've had a really enlightening time speaking with the author of The Miracle Workers, Boy Versus Beast. Our guest has been Renee Marsh. Renee, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great holiday. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. It's time for another Reading With Your Kids Rewind episode. This time, we're we're calling it Bollywood. We're taking a look back at our conversations with Bollywood stars turned children's authors. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, if you're the author of a fantastic children's book, please do visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the authors, click here button at the top of the page. Find out how we can help you celebrate your great book. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our guest, Renee Marsh. Please be sure to check out The Miracle Workers, Boy vs. Beast. And also, please be sure to check out how you can help support uh, pediatric cancer research. I also want to thank our sponsors, The Power of Gratitude by Ruth Molly and Freaky Funky Fish by Deborah Kemp Shoemaker. I also want to thank my team, Alejandra Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. <laughs>